So Ahmed Ugut is here today and he's one of the initiators of the Silent University. Um, he studied design in Ankara, Amsterdam and Istanbul, but I think you can introduce yourself better than I. So welcome. Is this working now? Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, anything you want to add? So the organization, so um, Ahmed is talking first and if you have urgent questions, just ask them and after the presentation you can ask questions, but like just for a small amount of time and then Eva Kuczynski is talking and then we are going into the big discussion, all of us with both, the to both of the topics. Yep. Yes, if you have very urgent questions, you can ask also during the presentation. I'm going to keep it short. I just try to calculate. Uh, it has been eight years since Silent University started. You know, I've been doing this talk sometimes and I always said uh, after five years, it's possible to talk about such an initiative. But this university is 10 years old. So we are similar age. <laughs> Uh, so Silent University was, um, you know, started in a very small context and um, in the, in, it was part of a residency. Um, I was invited uh, in London and uh, by one museum and one foundation and they asked me to do a community project. I mean, until then I was doing my independent installations and exhibitions and so on. I was not doing directly community engaged project and I'm really uh, against that term, by the way. Uh, when I was invited first time to do such thing, uh, specifically find a specific group of community and work with them as an artist, I find the whole thing wrong. But I, I took it as a challenge. I said, okay, so if this is going to be a challenge and there is a format like that exists in the art world, uh, let's challenge the institution as well. So it's not only me who is taking a challenge like that and try to get out of that uh, format, which is one is something, you know, you call projects. Uh, they are short term. They die after short, uh, when the budget finished and the time is over. Uh, by the host institution and workshops. Workshops are even smaller and one weekend, three days and you know it's, it's time duration is even smaller when it comes to workshops. And these are very common things when it comes to this kind of socially engaged community projects in the arts. Um, it's always short-term engagement. I was, I started that research with being critical to that. And it was a large institution, the largest we work uh, in terms of Silent University to the date. It started with the largest one, it was Tate Modern in London. Um, and uh, I thought, okay, with a larger institution, you can actually initiate larger things. And, and when you start to initiate a parasitic or academy, uh, a university like Silent University, I call it parasitic. Um, and, and um, it could be even possible to do, achieve bigger things, which was not the case. And now I will explain very quickly, now this story can be so long, this, the, the way we deal with institutions in every different scale. Uh, we'll get back to that shortly. Um, what is Silent University? Well, so when I went to UK at the time, there was no Brexit, nothing, you know, in 2011, and, uh, and uh, there was no migration crisis in mainstream media, there was nothing, none of these things. Arab Spring just like happening, and it was not even, you know, uh, that big at that moment um, as a major news for the news ag agencies, uh, main, mainstream ones. I went to UK and I just uh, sincerely observed what's happening in this community. They had so many community organizations uh, in every neighborhood and focusing on people in different age, uh, different disabilities or genders and which country they come from. So uh, every community organization was focusing on that, like old people, teenagers from Afghanistan or people living in Peckham, you know, all this like grouping people under these very quick categories. And th they function under those categories. I was not interested with that, like going to one of those community centers and uh, working with predefined group of people. 
I find that wrong as well. So that everything became very impossible to do anything around this. When I discovered um, at a time in UK it was really bad uh, if you arrive undocumented to UK, waiting process, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about this asylum seeking process or uh, uh, trying to become a refugee in, in a country and uh, get a permit. Uh, I didn't know anything about those processes as an artist. Uh, I, I paid attention and I realized there are actually quite many people. They wait up to 20 years uh, for a phone call, for an answer. And without having any documents, they cannot practice any of the skills they have. So these people, you can see here names, but you can also see what they were they used to do. This is the first group of people involved at the time in 2012 with Silent University in London. And also we have few names from Hamburg, they're still, and Stockholm, they're still involved. And uh, you can see they were like doctors or uh, human rights uh, activist, language teacher, accountant, calligrapher. You know, they had all this... Uh, jobs or degrees back in their countries, in their own languages, but when they come to UK, they are not recognized. So the waiting process was so long that you can ever, never become a doctor again. And, you know, it's or it takes like 10 to 20 years to restudy the same thing if you are actually in a good shape or a good age uh, to learn the local language, uh, main language in the country. So without uh, legal limitations or language limitations, can we actually imagine a school? That was the question and that was the beginning of Silent University. And I... I, I uh, shared this idea with the institution who invited me, but I told them, if we start doing this, it's not going to be this one-year contract you have with me, and you're not going to be talking to me only, you're going to be talking to an organization. And at the time, there was nothing. It was just me proposing an idea. And within uh, a year, uh, we were already like around 40 people involved in London, and there was uh, already lectures, public lectures and events and a library, everything has been created and a big symposium we organized towards the end of that year. But interesting thing that when you are this kind of parasitic uh, academic organization, uh, in collaboration with other institutions, they can be very large scale or small scale, but all have different uh, functions. Uh, you can achieve a lot. So you can individually uh, collaborate with everybody involved instead of grouping them under these easy categories. Like uh, Bridget Nongo, when she came and took part, uh, she was not able to share her name. So we could only share her initials of her name, B and N. And also she, she was not able to do a public speech view showing her face. So we had to really find a solution without showing her face and identity to acknowledge her skills as a nurse when she was back in uh, Congo. And then two years later, we were able to continue without Tate, uh, with other institutions in London. When she got a residency permit, she was able to uh, give a lecture um, showing her face and her name. So the, all the process, by the way, the first group of people, uh, these are also from first group of lectures uh, at the time, uh, th those years, those first two years. When they get a residency permit and uh, sometimes even citizenship, uh, of course, they can just become consultants and uh, lecturers with a face and with a name and with a biography that is acknowledged and shared with public. Another thing was this legal limitation was uh, terrifying you know, for, and still is like that for more people to go in front of public. Uh, and we had to figure out a way without putting me in danger. And also the, the, the other thing was the language. You know, they, they can give a lecture but only in their own language or in their native language or in the language they prefer. So they were free to do that in Silent University first time as well. So it was like this first, this first two things. We didn't wait. We didn't care about the legal process. We acknowledge everybody's knowledge immediately and also the language immediately. It was our problem if we are sitting on the other side and if, uh, if the language is given, uh, if the lecture is given in a language that we don't understand, it's our problem, not their problem. So we shift, uh, you know, the direction. So it was not the... Uh, also when... Um, you know, the first examples of this 
uh, universities and governments wanted to, after two, three years after we initiated Science University, especially in 2015, they wanted to do, all of them wanted to do a refugee school or something like that. Uh, they wanted to focus on students. They wanted to see them still as students. They wanted to see it as still as an integration problem, not as their own problem. It's like how we can solve this integration problem, how they can learn the, in, in terms of German, in German language, they can learn faster. How they can get integrated to, into the, that uh, uh, monolingual uh, education system that is mainly very locally uh, motivated. And uh, all universities trying to look very international. Um, we did the, the other way around. We actually started with the teachers and their urgent needs and the way they can share their knowledge. And then we start thinking about who could actually get that knowledge. It, it came afterwards. It was the other way around. Um, also their position, positions shift. So everybody's position, the more they involve, they become, you know, they become, they were members and they become lecturers and they become consultants and they become coordinators. And slowly I fade out as well. I disappear from the scene. And that was the idea. Uh, so all, uh, the, currently there are three, but in between we had three others uh, in Athens, in Amman, um, in, in London one was active. Currently in Hamburg, in Stockholm, and in Mülheim, uh, Ruhr, uh, we have three uh, uh, periodically uh, active uh, silent universities with their own agenda, with their own uh, ideas and schedules. And these are from some events in different places, Stockholm and London. And we also try to find different ways to introduce this idea. Like in uh, Belgium, they wanted to make one. A lot of countries failed to initiate their own. Because the question was, uh, you can initiate for a year, something like that, especially art institutions. But they don't know how to continue. Uh, they usually fail, uh, fail like a, a year later. So whenever I could sense that, I, I wouldn't let them start a branch. But whenever I could see that and uh, address and stress about this continuity idea, they would sometimes also decide themselves, well, we cannot actually, we really want to do this, but we cannot do this. And when somebody comes and they say we can do it, and it's like for three years or five years, they really have to think about when they step out, participants how they can take the initiative and continue and this was the case in these three uh, examples of silent university the first curators directors uh, coordinators they are all gone their contract is over but the participants took over and that's what i was hoping to happen at least in some of the branches and it happened like that because it is not a top-down organization, but to, to start uh, initiate such thing, you cannot ask people who already don't have documents, they don't have any income, bank accounts, nothing, to in just get self-organized and initiate something. You need a structure, you need other institutions to start it with. We tried that in Athens and in Amman, where there is no institutional structure, but a very group of enthusiastic people that they can initiate, but this was also over after a year or two. So they couldn't manage to continue without having institutional collaborations in their own terms. So when we collaborate with institutions, with the university, with the big museum, or with the community center, not in their term, but it has to be in silent universities, ethical uh, and practical principles. <laughs> this is another presentation. We collaborated with um, another like group of uh, self-organized, uh, undocumented, politically organized people in Amsterdam and in Berlin in this uh, different environments, once also in parliament in Amsterdam. This is how people register since the beginning and it's not really activated so much, but this was my initial idea and I really hope that this part also develop, uh, but it didn't so much. We did some exchanges, so anyone can register uh, online and they write their, their own skills, what they can offer in exchange to Silent University. So it's not as cool that you know you, you pay a fee and you get in, <laughs> something like that, but you actually offer a specific skill that you can offer and you are uh, part of the community. And there has been many people, uh, 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 hundreds of people joined, and you can see that people from different interests, not only like art students, 
uh, but also researchers, educators, uh, all kinds of people uh, involved and wanted to, and they were curious about taking part in this. And this new process now, in, in the last two years, it, it has been changed a lot, and I'm involved a lot less. Uh, for instance, Hamburg uh, also changed. It was, it seems like it's dying, but actually after the director left, uh, they are able to run it themselves. Uh, two activists uh, mainly leading it from the first group and uh, they still don't have their official documents but they are able to run it uh, still and if the director came to same organizations they are able to continue and this is also an example from Stockholm uh, Fahima who was a lecturer became an initiator there and even a leader uh, uh, and uh, she has a new group of people coming. So it's the second and third, term, third term of people. And these are also all uh, particip first participants. You know, people were curious and they believed in the idea. And now they're the coordinators. Uh, Omar, Justin, Bridget, and Nicholas are themselves coordinating every single event in Milheim of Silent University in at least four languages. They all speak different languages as well. So every presentation done in multiple languages. They also have sometimes a simultaneous translation, but often people translate to each other. So it's never like just in English or just in German. So it's a quite interactive presentations. Everyone in the room involves, not just one person speaking and others listen. It's that kind of initiative right now. And they have uh, regular meetings. Especially Bridget is very actively involved and she also initiated Intercultural Women's Empowerment Network, they call it. Um, they realize a lot of women cannot just join Silent University because of this uh, traditional family structures they come from. Um, so to make them feel more participatory and involved, uh, they created a parallel silent university only with women lecturers and uh, they could go to those events actually without having any uh, domestic trouble. And they have been organizing in parallel to the other silent university uh, events and lectures, uh, this empowerment link network, uh, which is growing constantly. It was Bridget's idea. And this is uh, an, another recently happened in December, a talk here. Uh, organized by Silent University Hamburg. Abim Bola was the moderator. And uh, it was also about uh, collective feminist practice. Of course, the one in Hamburg is more activist than the one in Mülheim. The one in Mülheim is more institutional and it's somehow possible to uh, create that institutional network and really transform them in a smaller place which in sometimes they invite university deans and uh, politicians to their debates and they come in a small place. It's very possible uh, to, to discuss everything in a very horizontal level. And, and here, yeah, there was uh, uh, the participation also when there was all these trucks in Hamburg, Silent University had one, and it was led by Sala and Abimbola, who are the uh, coordinators currently, but they were lecturers before. Uh, it's another picture from Hamburg Gathering. We also, you know, this was like a very wanted idea in the beginning, and I really try to stop people. Like, this is not about, uh, yes, we need to do something about this. No, we need to continue uh, and solve this problem. And uh, after all these uh, branches, uh, we had also in Paris one, and in London, and they don't continue right now, or Anman in Athens, uh, we decided to make this publication to talk about our failures, why it didn't work. For instance, in Anman, it was about security. You cannot invite people, undocumented people, to the university because that's the first place police invades uh, in, in Athens also. And in Amman, they were, there was already undercover police sitting in the group uh, who came to the lecture. So it became very dangerous for people. Even if you protect their face or their names, it was very dangerous to operate uh, in Amman to continue with the same idea. And in Athens also, it was uh, for a while possible, but it was not that safe. And... Um, to, f to finish, I think it's already like more than half an hour maybe. Um, so all this thing is not about people who don't have 
documents who don't have access to the education system. It's about how to transform and change the education system. It's not only about specific group of people lecturing to specific group of people. So it's, it's really about how we can reimagine the university, um, universities today and that they are not corporations, they are not uh, just big companies becoming more and more company-like places, but uh, they are places for sharing knowledge and active involvement of every, every student that are part of it. And um, for that, that's why we, we propose decentralized participatory horizontal and autonomous modality of education. Thank you. I can take questions later if there is no urgent one, and we can go to the next presentation. Teams come, so no urgency. We'll do it later. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, is there a question? Good. So we continue later, and we think we have also some time to think of it. Thanks a lot. So. Um, Eva Kuczynski is our next guest. Um, um, yes. Eva is um, a scientific associate in the field of history and theory of the city at HCU. Um, she's part of the DFG network Feminist Geographies of New Materialism and of the AK Geography and Gender. Um, she studied sociology and human geography and for her dissertation project she's re researching in the field of housing production. Um, from my personal experience, um, she's a very perspective opening and caring teacher. <laughs> Oops, okay, microphone works. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, well, I have to get used to this thing. Okay, yeah, so my name is Eva, I work here, you heard that. Um, unfortunately, I'm uh, alone here today. I was planning to do this talk together with my colleague Nina, Nina Fraser. Um, we've been working here together for over three years um, and we have had a lot of, um, I don't know, discussions about our work practice, about academia and yeah, so everything I will say today derives um, from collective processes. I'm really, am I right, am I wearing this right? Yeah? Okay. Nein? Yeah. Maybe you can say that um, and the feedback. Vielleicht kann man die noch weiter nach vorne machen. Vielleicht gibt es dann weniger Feedback. Die Boxen. Die Box. Okay. <laughs> I will try to speak louder, but I, th I don't think I could do it without the microphone, actually. Hello? Is this on? Okay. All right. Um, where was I? Okay, so um, everything I say uh, in this talk is derived from collective discussion processes, and there are very different us and we's in this talk. So I think most of the time I mean Nina and me. A lot of times I mean um, the other authors and uh, me, <laughs> you know, the other authors from the text you, some of you might have written, uh, read. And sometimes I mean something I'm 
figures as like precarious knowledge workers or something. Um, yeah, and but I think most of the discussions I'm telling you about arrive from these like feminist geographies, networks. This is like the circle of people we're talking about. So most of them students, PhD students, postdocs, most of them self-identified as females, all of them pretty white. Um, I don't know about their family background, but I think, yeah, um, it's like a quiet institutionalized scene, maybe also especially in comparison to the silent university. So, and Maybe it's also really a privileged position in some regards, but then again, we're uh, struggling a lot with the institution of the of the university, and so we're not actually. I'm not talking as part of some alternative school, but uh, I can share some experiences uh, from yeah when we try to create spaces or moments that are not so much shaped by the institutional constraints of the university. Okay, so here's a quick outline. I will try to frame the university as a place of social reproduction, as a place of care work. Um, I will share some discussions Nina and me had about, um, like we call it everyday negotiations of hierarchies. Um, it's mostly um, concerning teaching and then I will try to let you know about some lessons from the feminist geographies meetings we had. Okay, is the sound now okay? Okay, so um, the term of social reproduction has several dimensions. In a broad sense, it means the remaking of the social world we live in. And in relation to the university, um, I will shed light on some dimensions, uh, which are sometimes overlapping, uh, lapping, but help me to make some uh, points. So the social work uh, world we live in from my or our perspective is shaped among other things by unequal social relations, which um, like deriving from US American black feminism are described through terms like triple oppression of race, class and gender. Um, and those inequalities are also reproduced within and through the university. Um, and as shown in the text by anne katrin Müller and Sarah Speck, I hope some of you might have uh, read, you know, this, the structure and ideology of the university is basically white and male and bourgeois. Um, so the second uh, point about the university that it is in more like an Althusserian way can be seen as an ideological state apparatus, um, which means that it plays a role in the everyday remaking of subjects that sort of work in the system uh, or believe in it, for example, through creating or evaluation systems uh, or other disciplinary measures or through career advice workshops or through the stuff you learn in class. Um, but of course, at the same time, universities, I think, and <clears throat> where do I put this? Over time, does this work? Okay. Over time and in different contexts also have been places of resistance and against those ideologies. And there have been places and there still are places for different practices of knowledge productions and critical thought. So I think they're really contested uh, institutions. Um, apart from that, the university, through its function um, to educate and train people, also contributes to the reproduction of a labor force. Um, and I think, like through the years of, like in Europe, the Bologna process and neoliberalization of universities, the focus has shifted from this, like more broader ideal of education to training and to employability. And this might also um, be reflected in the increasing entanglement of the private sector within universities or with universities. Um, and at least in the German context, I think uh, university is still part of public infrastructure. So they are a public, they're public goods and services, I think. Um, 
And thus, during the last years, they also became subject to austerity measures. Spamasnam. And some feminist researchers describe the consequences of austerity measures as crisis of social reproduction. This means, well, maybe simply put, that the provision with social goods is more constrained in these sectors of, uh, I don't know, social services are more burdened and the services don't work as well as they used to be or as they are intended to work. And actually life for people gets harder. Maybe we could say it like that. And if you apply it to the university, and I think Tillman Reitz in his talk said quite something about it, and also uh, Simon Sheik. Um, where was I? Yeah, when we apply to the university, it's not necessarily that there is less spending on education, it's just more unequally um, distributed. So basically people working at universities have to apply for everything, like for research funds, teaching funds, and... Um, I mean, some studies show it, and of course also talks with colleagues. Um, this leads to more exhaustion and more anxiety, more instability, and less time for the stuff that most people think that scholars are doing, like reading, doing research, writing, and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so I think there are more and more measures introduced to sort of control academic work and it's like quality and quantity but I um, and like measures that try to make it more efficient in a way um, but I think or we think um, like many other places of social reproduction or in the social sector and maybe also in difference to places of production efficiency cannot be raised without a tremendous loss in quality um, we also wrote about this in our Superban text and we sort of transferred uh, Julia Duke's argument from the health sector to the academic sector. Um, Julia Duke works on the case of labor struggles at the Charité in Berlin, like this huge hospital, um, where nurses, patients and patients' friends and family struggle together for better working conditions at the hospital. Because in hospitals, um, the introduction of uh, efficiency measures means that, for example, fewer nurses have to take care of more patients. And, I mean, this goes along with a loss of, loss of quality that is actually can become quite critically for the health of patients. So the reason for this uh, collaboration within this working struggle at Charité is that people saw that the working conditions of the nurses are directly connected to the well-being of the patients. And I think this is true for a lot of um, those public sector services that don't produce surplus value. Um, and I think it's not uh, possible to introduce efficiency and austerity measures there without causing a lot of pain and bad outcomes and results. Um, yeah. So at the university, I think the part most of us can relate to is teaching, um, like seminars and stuff. So the more a person has to teach and the less they're paid for it, the less time they have for preparation, for feedback, for supervision, they're less flexible. Um, this basically means that the studies of students get worse, I mean. I think it's, yeah, we can probably all see that. Um, and especially if we take into consideration that a lot of the lecturers you also have are not even employed at the university or are doing it in their extra time are not really paid for it. And I think you guys, I mean, you are not doing that on your paid time, I guess, this course at least. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I just really want to point that out that these like working conditions and and studying conditions are really closely connected and I think probably if you have a really good seminar you can you can guess that people put a lot of unpaid time into it. Um, but I also think it's um, or we saw that in our discussions that this is also in you know in this contradiction or in this um, in this component there there lay possibilities for solidarity and we will come to come back to that later or maybe we can also discuss about it um, oh yeah that was uh, not so smart I will put it here 
Um, Okay, um, we also discussed in this text the university as a place of care work, which is linked to the reproduction argument, but it's a little different. So for us, the university um, is a way, uh, is a place of care work, for example, in the way we treat each other, like among colleagues, um, the way we care for each other, and that sort of helps us undermine um, the logics of competition that the institutional structure of the university very often imposes on us. Um, or in relation to students, for example, when students, I mean, I don't know, the people of you who, who teach know what kind of excuses or really, I mean, reasons you get why people have to hand in papers later. And it's sometimes, I mean, it's sometimes really touching and I don't know, um, it's, I think it's a constant negotiation, how much of it you take into consideration or not. And I think what we try to do is, we try to take into consideration different positionalities also along the lines of like background, parents, money, health, um, experience, language and everything. Because of what I said before, the university is a place of social reproduction in a sense that it also tends to reproduce social hierarchies and inequalities. And I mean, we cannot stop that, um, and we are not aware of everything. Um, but a lot of times we try to deal with it. And this also means a lot of extra work and some sort of care chains, you know, then you start to talk to your colleague what you should do, and maybe to your friend, and um, yeah, so at the same time it's really, I mean, we don't feel like we are social workers, or, so it's really important also to have boundaries in this um, and to not care about everyone and everything. And sometimes you have your own stuff to deal with and no resources left. Um, anyways, I think care work is not part of our job description, but it's still a part of our job. And for sure, it's sort of unpaid labor. and. Um, Although it sort of reflects on our position towards the world, you know, to sort of be careful with uh, the people around us, it also, I mean, it has strongly gendered aspects. So there's this Canadian study um, that found that female professors are expected to be nicer, to be more caring, to... I don't know, you know, extend deadlines, upload a PowerPoint and stuff. And if they're not doing that, they're getting um, worse evaluations. So, um, so even those supposedly neutral evaluation uh, sheets you fill out every semester are probably gender biased. Um, so we sort of see this is like our own position, but at the same time, it's it's uh, strongly biased and and also exploited at, at some points. I mean, yeah, so this is one of those uh, feminist negotiations within the university. Um, okay, next I want to connect this whole topic of unpaid labor back to the austerity. Um, like especially in the disciplines where the private industry is not a competitor on the labor market, like social sciences and stuff, 50% um, positions are standard. Um, and we are expected to, for example, write our dissertations in our free time. I mean, what is supposed to be normal for us is, I think it would be quite outrageous for an engineer, someone who works, uh, who could also work in, a, in an industry where they actually make surplus um, money. Okay. Um, so, but what probably can be said that like the stuff that we supposedly love about our jobs, like the writing, like we're having workshops, giving talks like this one are mostly done in our unpaid time, not always, but I think big part of it. And that's, you know, the whole academy sort of, I mean, it's grounded on unpaid labor. And um, here we see a, a parallel to domestic labor, you know, the labor at the home, which is also a main topic of feminist movements and uh, theories, and also in, um, yeah, in the current debates around care work. So there's this slogan by the Wages for Housework campaign, I think it's derived from there. 
they call it love, we call it labor. And I think for academia, it could be, I mean, you could just leave it like that. You could also switch law for, I don't know, passion, inspiration, brilliance, uh, or other things that relate to this idea of the academic genius that doesn't want to be anything else but a scholar. Um, and I think this idea of academic work as like self-fulfillment resonates with discussions around um, the feminization of labor in the context of neoliberalism. So what do we mean by that? Um, there are like two parts to this. The first part um, is precarity, so that, are, that there are like an increasing amount of jobs that are paid like it was the second job um, in the household, like the extra money from the part-time job, um, but it's actually the only income of the household. Like um, in Germany, like the so-called normal Arbeitsverhältnis or, <laughs> or the male breadwinner model, you know, when, uh, when there was like one major income and one plus income. And I think like uh, around discussions of the feminization of labor, they, they see a normalization of those more precarious jobs. Um, and the second part of the feminization is adding love and passion to your job. To connect it with like meaning, to be asked to fully identify with your job and um, to believe uh, and the belief of self-fulfillment through your labor and your work because you love it. And I think this is also being analyzed as a, as the heritage of the 68 movement. Um, yeah, so the, there are these two parts of uh, neoliberal labor conditions and we think they are also combined with this myth of the genius in academia who will against all odds and against all precarity do everything he or she can um, to, uh, to make it and to be known for his or her work and maybe also become one or get one of those 12% permanent university positions that there are in Germany, I don't know. And uh, But the whole genius thing, I think also uh, Müller and Speck talked about uh, a lot about this in their text. If you haven't read it, uh, it's, it's really good, I think. Um, okay, so uh, instead of all that, uh, of course, we still choose this job. I mean, we, I want to have a job that is fun and that gives me meaning and everything. So also this insight means a lot of negotiations for us, I think. And um, I think there are like big parts of our jobs that we really like and we often feel privileged to be working at the university. And also for me, I, come, I don't come from an academic background. And so this, I don't, I don't know, I still sometimes think, okay, wow, I work at, at a university. This is not, I mean, this is not a normal thing for me. And on the other side, maybe because of the same reason, it's, for me, it's really important to call the work I do here labor, you know, and to, to make it something that can be contested and to make it something, um, I want to be paid for. And for me, it's important not to be humble and feel privileged to be allowed to work under these conditions. I don't know. And um, yeah, so for example, some colleagues, uh, some of them are also here today, we're trying to form a Hamburg wide, um, how do you say it, Mittelbau initiative, like all the uh, PhD, postdoc, all the people work, not professors, <laughs> not full professors at a university trying to, um, to, I don't know, engage in some labor struggle, basically. Um, but we're starting with some networking. Okay, um, so another aspect of those negotiations is um, we talk a lot about how we can negotiate institutional settings and hierarchies and how we can create spaces and moments of knowledge production that enrich us and make us actually feel good and help us to understand also beyond these like institutional logics. And um, at this point I try to go back to teaching or to this like relation between lecturers and students. Um, as I mentioned above, we see some possibilities for solidarity um, because of this connection between the working and the studying conditions. 
but also there are quite some institutional constraints. So before I go to the possibilities, first the constraints. Nina and I discussed some before Christmas and I will um, just share them with you. Um, for example, syllabi. Like when we put together a reading list and then we were like, ah, oh, we don't only, we sort of want to defy those classics and want to define new ones. We don't want like dead old white males uh, be the classics of urban studies, for example. But then again, I mean, we were taught that stuff at our university and, it, and we are, I mean, we haven't been reading for so long, so we don't know all these texts. Uh, so it would actually take a lot, a lot, a lot of efforts to find out who we could uh, take instead. And we, we do that, but we also fail at it. And then you could, I don't know, take six months to put together a good syllabus, yeah. So this is one example. Um, another one is um, like negotiations around like the classroom. So for us it's, it's important, I mean, no, to be approachable and to be um, non-bossy and stuff, but at the same time not, I don't know, not uh, pretend that this was a safe space or a room without hierarchies or anything because it's really not. So we are not equals in the classroom because we grade you. So we give grades to students so we have, are more powerful in this, um, in this moment at least. And uh, we also actually, especially when we started working here, discussed a lot what would happen if we would give everyone an A and if this was possible and if, if it could change anything and what would happen to us. So we, we decided not to do it. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we can also discuss that. <laughs> um, okay, so it's uh, sort of important to, I mean, I don't know, to create a respectful, good atmosphere, but at the same time not pretend that, that there are no hierarchies. Um, yeah, and then I think a practice that Nina and I established uh, to make explicit what kind of positions we have, like what kind of jobs. So I try to say that I'm only reachable from Tuesday to Thursday because I only have a 50% position. And I mean, it's good for me because I, you know, I can sort of lower expectations and say I'm not always reachable. But I think it's also important to fight this image of the academic who's always working and will answer student mails at 3 a.m. on a Saturday night. And I mean, people do that. I got those emails and I don't want to be the person writing them. And I also really do not write emails at, at 3 a.m. But yeah, even if by accident I would, I would try not to send them or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay, so, and these are all constraints that cannot really be overcome in this institutional setting while I'm working my job and have to give grades and stuff. And um, yeah, so we try to engage in other spaces um, where maybe there are more possibilities and, and less institutional constraints and hierarchies. And these are the feminist geography meetings. So this is a photo of the last meeting uh, which took place in Bonn in uh, November. And um, yeah, I think right now the people organizing it are mostly students, also some PhD students, some profs, young professors, um, they are all genders welcome, most of them, most of the people are not cis male, I guess. Um, okay, so these meetings, I will uh, try to hurry. Uh, were formed in the late 80s and took place until 2004 and then sort of, I don't know, vanished and um, some colleagues picked it up again in 2014-15 in form of a seminar. I was also studying uh, back then and uh, took took part and yeah, since then it took place annually and um, we wrote this Superbahn article after we uh, organized the meeting in Hamburg in 2017. And um, I tried to uh, crystallize three lessons that um, 
we took from from organizing this workshop or this this meeting so usually organizing this kind of stuff can be really i don't know stressful exhausting you have to think of everything and everyone asks you anything i don't know it can be super stressful but um so we tried and we saw that in the year before so we really tried to um to share tasks and work like making coffee watching the time moderating the evening event um helping the food crew cut vegetables i don't know and this meant for us that we actually had to give away quite some control because then i mean if you say like give tasks to some strangers you maybe never met you don't know what's going to come out um but it also took really a lot of burden off of us and um so we didn't neglect responsibility but we shared it and actually this uh, felt really good and so and i think we sort of succeeded in a lot of moments to create an atmosphere of mutual support during these like three days we had the meeting and I mean, like sharing the task is, of course, only like this sort of micro technique of, um, um, yeah, of facilitating this kind of atmosphere. And it's not, I mean, it's not an end in itself. It could, it could help. For example, we tried to transfer some of these ideals and ideas to a more professionalized workshop last September here at HCU. Um, and this didn't work at all, really. We failed in a lot of, um, I mean, in some parts we didn't fail, but in a lot of parts we really failed and it didn't work at all. So I think, yeah, it, I mean, it needs some engagement and the right attitude by, by everyone involved. Um, so the second lesson is uh, about empowerment. And I think it's very similar to a lot of stuff you do in the seminar. So, um, Empowerment, like to empower people to do something in a more or less academic context they never did before. For example, moderating an evening event, giving a talk or whatever. And um, I think we also learned from our own experiences that it's often not enough to just say, okay, you can do it, just do it, because then you're alone with it. So for us, it was important to have like a more collective process. So we... Um, yeah, we prepared together, we read like texts together before an evening event. Um, and I think it's also especially important for people maybe who don't have this academic background, who don't have the habitus, uh, who don't know how to talk in the settings. Um, and in the end, we had this like evening event with, we were like 50 people and we had this huge, massive circle of people and uh, two invited lecturers. And I think like, almost everyone said something in the discussion or contributed. And it was really, I don't know, it was really nice atmosphere. And also um, the two people we uh, invited said that they actually never experienced anything like that in an academic setting and then that they felt really welcome and um, had a really good experience. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds really tiny, but it really helped and it, I don't know, it shows how important maybe also these like spatial settings uh, can be. Um, and the third lesson is, um, well, about, um, what did I write here? Yeah sharing different experiences and knowledges. Um, so we did uh, a bar camp, which basically means that everyone come with their different ideas and then you cluster them and then you take a lot of time to find out what you want to do and then you do it. And we had like, I don't know, one and a half days for that. Um, and it, in most cases, worked out pretty well. Mm. So... For example, my own experience was that I was in a in a workshop on working conditions, surprise, at the university. And um, there were some people working in the academic sector and it was actually, maybe also, I wasn't, I mean, I was, no, I was working there for a while, but it was really important to, you know, to share like good stuff, but also to share the more embarrassing stuff or maybe um, insecurities or bad experiences um, and to learn that you're, not alone. So this can be really empowering to 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 really learn 
that you're not the only slacker uh, watching Netflix on the weekend and that not everyone is, I don't know, reading 10 books or something. I mean, there's really this, there's this image, so um, it's good to destroy it collectively. Um, and yeah, and the other part, which was also really important for me and for us, uh, was also described in this article, that there was this feminist geographies uh, gang from Bonn. I mean, I don't know. Well, and uh, they were really clear about this whole thing with the working conditions and the and the studying conditions. And I don't know, they just said it right on point. And they were, you know, they choose also to be in this workshop about working conditions. And um, so we shared a lot of, you know, these like everyday experiences, how it is for us, how it is for them, how they how they work together with their lecturers, in what in what ways. They also had these like self-organized seminars and also negotiated with themselves how much unpaid labor they were doing. And so, I don't know, it was, um, it was a really good experience of sharing, sharing these knowledges and um, also to share them from different positions within the university. And I think this really helped also to, to build solidarities on this level. And um, at the same time, we also reconnected those everyday experiences and knowledges to the social relations uh, we are constantly analyzing, which uh, actually brings me back to the beginning of the talk, um, because uh, like these very discussions made it possible to us to look at the university as a place of reproduction and a place of care work. And uh, I think for me and us, um, this is also the really good thing about feminist uh, epistemologies or perspectives because um, because they they allow us to connect everyday experiences with social relations and or our analysis of social relations and thus of course I think it can also help to criticize, analyze and hopefully also undermine the university as we know it today. Done.